أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ومولاي يا الله الواسع ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمة وقل رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وال محمد اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد This holy verse of Quran is very unique that is giving two commands. The first command is the very fundamental command, and that is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All prophets, all messengers, all monotheistic religions have come with this command, and that is to worship the God. The second command, however, is a little bit different. Right after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Do good towards your parents. Honoring parents. Many people would wonder why. It is important that we honor the parents. Yet, there are many important laws and commands that God should have stated before this. What is the reason? Why God would equate those two, conjugate those two commands together. First, worshiping God, and second, being nice to parents. What is the message? What is the verse it's trying to say? Inshallah, during this lecture, I will point to a few reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is equating or conjugating between the command of worshiping Him and the command of being nice and doing good toward our parents. The first reason, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to strike a similarity between himself and the parents. Trying to draw our attention to the fact that there are certain similarities between the Almighty and our parents. What are those similarities? I will talk about the three points. The first point is the source of the creation. God is the creator of the universe. God has created all of us. Now take any human being. All the human beings who are brought up to this world, who have made it, they grow, they flourish, they proliferate, they make progenies, we advance, 
Some of us become lawyers, some of, them, some of us become doctors, professionals, engineers, athletes, government officials, the president, and you name it. Now, all of those good things, all of those advancements require one thing, one condition. And that condition provided that God created us. I mean, I have advanced. I have reached a very high post. But if I have not been created by God, I am simply nothing. Nothing of those advancements we will end up seeing. The society will not see me. The community will not see me. No matter how good I am, it's simply nothing. Why? Because God has not created me. So it all depends on that moment that God decided to create me. That's why we say it is the source of the creation. All of those good things that I have achieved all belong to that moment that God has made me and brought me to this universe, to this, to this life. In some time of history, we were nothing. In some time in history in the future, we are nothing. The ayah says, هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينٌ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينٌ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا Have you imagined a time in history that this human being is considered nothing? Yes. Hundred years ago, all of us were nothing. Hundred years from now, again, I will assure you, all of us are still are nothing. It is this moment that we live in Whatever advancement, whatever good things we do and accomplish, all depends on the moment that God has created us. The same thing could be said about the parents. That now I give speeches, or the doctor performs surgery and he's a surgeon, or the lawyer in the court defend the criminal or other people, and the president becomes the president and goes to the, to the Oval Office, all depends on the moment that he was conceived in the womb of his mother. It is all due to the fact that his parent has brought him to this universe. If they have decided not to bring him, he were not there. Therefore, all our accomplishments is subject and taken hostage to the fact that it is our parents who have brought us. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. He's the one who has created us. But always when he does things, he does it through proper channels. Anything. If you are sick, you want to be healed. God is the one who will heal us. He is the one who will heal us. But, what, but what, by what means? We have to take the medicine. وَإِذَا مَرَثْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ But how? Sitting at home, would I be cured? I have to go after the doctor. At that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow upon me the healing. The same thing, the food that we eat, the nourishment, the subsistence that we eat. Who's the one who's providing? God. But, but what you mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, which means? He says, وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِسْقًا لَكُمْ God has poured down from the clouds rain, so by this rain, food and subsistence comes from the ground, so you eat and make it a nourishment for you. It's a means. The same thing, the parents are the proper cha channel for our existence. Here the Imam, Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, has very beautiful words. He says that, do you want to know the right of your parents? The right of your parents is this. It says, وَحَقُّ أَبِيكَ أَن تَعْلَمَ أَنَّهُ أَصْلُكَ وَأَنَّهُ لَوْلَاهُ لَمْ تَكُمْ The right of your father, and of course this applies to the mother as well, to the parent. He says, the right of your parents is that you know he is your origin, he is your base. وَأَنَّهُ لَوْلَاهُ لَمْ تَكُنْ If you were not there, you also did not exist. And then he says, 
فمهما رأيت في نفسك ما يعجبك فاعلم أن أباك أصل النعمة عليك Anything that interests you about yourself You think you're, mashallah, you became a doctor You became a president You became so well known Know that it is the origin came from your father He has the favor, the mother and father has the favor on you So if you are a president, thanks to your father and mother if you are an athlete, a well-known athlete, thanks to your parents. If you are a doctor, thanks to your parents. All of those are the favors of our parents. One day, one man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, Ya Rasulullah, my father has passed away. My mother is alive, but she's very frail and old. She cannot hear, she cannot see, she's paralyzed. But I take care of her. I grab the food, I ground it, and feed her piecemeal by piecemeal. I change her clothes. I clean her, clean her. I clean her bed. I put her to bed, make sure that to sleep, then I leave the home. You think that I have paid back what she deserves? You see how arrogant we are, brothers and sisters? Once we do a good thing, little, tiny, little good thing, in our eyes, we consider it's a huge, magnificent. Oh, I did such kind of favor to that person. What did the Prophet, peace be upon him, say? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, La, of course you did not. You did not pay back anything. He said, Ma addayta haqqa wa la zafratin wahidatin heena wa when the woman goes through the labor to deliver her baby, how many times she moans and cries? The Prophet says, you did not even pay back a single cry that she did. This is a why. Because even the good things that we do to our, parent, to our parents, it is the favor of them. It is them who have the favor on us. Therefore, we never, never ever can pay back the Consider Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask yourself, who has brought you to this majlis today? There are many people who go to the night clubs. Many people go to the movie theaters. Who have brought you here? To listen to the majlis of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Isn't it God? God is the source of guidance. Who? He is the one who has guided us to be the true followers of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam To attain such kind of, you know, Majalis and the blessings. This is a blessing of God. At the same time that we worship Him, we get it closer to Him, the favor goes back to God. The ayah says, it says, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. Walawla wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. This is that ask for, you know, th be, th be thankful to Allah that he has made this possible. Even worshiping him is a blessing. He has made it possible. There are many people who don't worship him. So we should be lucky. The same way, when we do good to our parents, it is a favor that they have done. Even when we are fortunate enough to pay some of their hardship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is a favor that's bestowed by your parents about you. So the first reason is the source of the creation. The second reason is the unconditional love. I will continue after your big salawat. This salawat is not for the second night of Muharram. This salawat is for the Hajjah. I need to hear a loud salawat for Muharram. We establish a friendship. We make relationship. Those relationships are all mutual. Meaning, I show love and affection toward the other person, to my friend, provided that he does the same. No one does a favor without any return. Anyone who does a favor has to be, either through friendship or for some financial compensation, some physical compensation sometimes. 
whatever. Basically, whatever you do, you're asking for return. Even the believers, even the good people, the moment when he helps, when he goes through charity to help the poor people, he doesn't ask the return from the poor. Rather, he asks the return from whom? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He needs to earn the tawam in the hereafter. Never there is anyone who gives you something, provides you something without expecting a return. Especially when it comes to love and affection. Except two entities. One is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who shows his unconditional love to all indiscriminately. He does not discriminate between the believer and non-believer. Between the one who worships him and someone who goes against him. And the other one are the parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all in this universe, in this life. There are many who worship him. He provides for them. There are many who are agnostic. There are many who are enemies of God. They hate the name of God, yet he provides for them. In the dua of Rajab, he says, Ya man yu'ti man sa'alah. Ya man yu'ti man lam yas'alhu wa man lam ya'rifhu tahannunan minhu wa rahim. Even those who do not ask. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for them. Give them without asking for return, without saying you have to pay back, nothing. One reason that we say Ar-Rahman, the most beneficent, what does it mean Ar-Rahman? Ar-Rahman means that the mercy of God is so inclusive that take the kafir, the mu'min, the believer, the agnostic, the atheist, all are included in the mercy of God without any return. The same is applied to the parents. Look at the parents. They raise us. They feed us. They send us to school. They help us to finish college. They put us in college afterward. We stay with them for what return? Do they ask for any return? Do they look for return? No. Look at the mother. She carries her son and her daughter in her wombs for nine months. She goes through hardships. Through difficulties. You know what the fetus does? The fetus is a parasite to the mother. It doesn't stay there passively. It competes with the mother for the food, for the nutrition. You see that the side effects of the pregnancy, when, you know, when the pregnant develops high blood pressure, sometimes, or bleeding gums, constipation, hair loss, back bone problems, what are those for? All is due to the fetus. The fetus is competing with the, you know, with the mother for nutrition. According to statistics, every year there are 520,000 pregnant women who die during labor. During labor, when they, you know, bring their children, they die. More than 10 million people, 10 million pregnant, suffer from injuries, infections, and complete disabilities due to pregnancy. But look at the mother. She does this with passion, with love, with affection, with joy, so much joy, despite the fact that this is all costing her health, her well-being. Yet she provided. Why she provides this one? Is it for any return? She does this for us. Even when they ask us to go to school. You see, the, the son, the daughter is careless. We're careless about our grades. We don't care if we do good in the quiz or not. But you see that the parent suffers much. Once we get back, the first question the mother asks, how did you do in the exam? How did you answer the quiz? Did you answer that question right or not? Why? For what reason? For themselves? or for the son and the daughter. This is the second feature, brothers and sisters. The third one, again, after your big and loud salawat.
the third feature that is common between the Almighty God and the parents, it is the attitude of both that does not change if we misbehave, if we make a sin. Again, you see that love and affection stay the same way. How many times we commit sins in daily basis? You don't need to count for one month. In one day, when you go to bed, sit down, take a pen, and write down how many times you commit a mistake and a sin. Write it between yourself and God. Don't let any other person know. Make a list. Doesn't that exceed 20, 30 times per day? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala embraces us. Tell us, it's okay. Ask for repentance and I will forgive you. Give us so many, you know, chances. A chance after chance. Tells you go to Hajj. When you go to Hajj, your, you know, your sins all are forgiven. Ask for repentance. Come to the majalis. Do the prayers. The prayers will wash your sins. Just give us a chance after a chance. It says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Oh, those people who have exaggerated, does not even say, the, look at the verse, look at the affection of God. He does not say that you have committed a sin. He says, if you have exaggerated upon yourself, لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Don't be turned away from the blessing, from the mercy of Allah. إن الله يخفر الذنوب جميعا. There is an elegant saying in Dua Abu Hamza. You know the Imam, Imam Sajjad, Imam Zain al Abidin عليه السلام. He says الحمد لله الذي تحبب إلي وهو غني عني. He showed me his love, but for no, you know, no need. He's so needless, yet he shows the love. والحمد لله الذي يحلم عني كأني لا ذنب لي. He forgives me if I have not committed any sin. I have not done anything wrong. You know, in the elegant du'a of du'a al-iftitah in Ramadan, he says, the Imam alayhi salam says, فَلَمْ أَرَ مَوْلًا كَرِيمًا أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدٍ لَئِيمٍ مِنْكَ عَلَيَّ يَا رَبِ إِنَّكَ تَتَحَبَّبُ إِلَيْهِ فأتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أجازي كأن لي التطول عليك I am the arrogant you are asking me to come forward but I don't but it is you who are getting closer to me فلم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي despite my misbehavior yet God tells me come forward if you don't come forward, I come forward. And the narration says, whoever comes one yard forward to God, God will come one mile toward him. Ask him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his attitude does not change, even despite our sinning, our misbehavior. The same is applied to the parents. How many times we do foolish things, we insult our parents, sometimes verbally, sometimes physically. We attack them, yet they embrace us. They forgive us completely. As nothing has happened in just in two minutes, once we say something outrageous, criminal, sinful, yet they forget, forget about it completely and forgive us completely. There is a beautiful story in the form of poetry. I'm sure all of you have heard of it, but I will recite it here. It's about an old man who fools a young man. Tell him, I will give you jewelry, I give you money, give you everything, but in return for one thing. I want you, I want you to go and grab the fresh heart of your mother and bring it to me. This is the, you know, this is the price. Get me the heart of your mother, I will give you the jewelry, the money that you want. This young man goes with a dagger in his hand, he goes and stabs his mother. He stabs, he rips 
the chest of his mother open, takes the heart away, and runs toward this man. As he goes, he goes so fast, he stumbles. He falls on the ground. Let's look at what the poetry says. He says that, فَمَضَى وَأَغْمَدَ خَنْجَرًا فِي صَدْرِهَا وَالْقَلْبُ أَخْرَجَهُ وَعَادَ عَلَى الْأَثَرِ He said that he hit her with the dagger. He cuts the chest into two pieces and he grabbed the heart, took it away and rushed back toward him. لَكِنَّ مِنْ فَرْقِ سُرْعَتِهِ هَوَى فَتَدَحْرَجَ الْقَلْبِ الْمُقَطَّعُ إِذْ أَثَرِ He said that as he was walking, he stumbles on the rock, he falls. The heart also falls. Now, the discourse, the talk of the heart. Look at the heart of the mother. He says that, نَادَاهُ قَلْبَ الْأُمْ وَهُوَ مُعَفَّرٌ وَلَدِي حَبِيبِي هَلْ أَصَابَكَ مِنْ بَعْرٍ he says that this heart, the bloodied heart, all of a sudden started speaking to this man. He said, oh my sweetheart, have you hurt yourself? At that time, the man realizes what kind of a crime he committed. He grabs the dagger to hit himself, to, kid, to commit a suicide, to kill himself. Look what the heart tells him again. He says that, نَادَاهُ قَلْبَ الْأُمِّ كُفَّيَدَ the heart again told them, stop, don't continue. Why? ولا تنبح فؤادي مرتين على الأثر He tells them, do not kill me twice. You kill me once, don't kill me twice. This is how mother is. Do we really give it back? Do we show, you know, some of what they offer, do we give them back? How many of us Return the favor to them. There are horrible statistics here in the U.S. Let me just tell you some of them. According to some numbers that, some figures, it says that in the U.S. there are about 16 million elderly and senior citizens. It says that out of those, out of those 16 million people, there are 5,962,000 times cases reported to the police for the elderly abuse. In what form? Sometimes physical abuse. They attack them. Sometimes murders. They kill them. Sometimes verbal abuse. Sometimes even abandonment and negligence. They leave them by themselves. How do we return it once they become old and frail and depend on us, on our basic needs, we leave them to their own. The nursery homes, there are 16,000 nursery homes in this country with 86% occupancy. Look how much we do. Once they are frail, we put them in our car, we drop them in the nursery and fi amanillah. Forget about them. The average time that a senior citizen is spent in those nursery homes is 835 days, meaning two years and four months. This is the average time a senior citizen spends his time or her time in nurseries. This is how we reward them. This is how we tell them thank you. This is for all the good things that they have done to us. Eventually, we leave them and tell them, you are at your own. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. I was coming through, you know, when we left home and coming, I was listening to a CD by a Persian speaker, Khatib, a well-known Khatib. His name is Rashid. This man stated an amazing story brothers and sisters. He said that one day another scholar, another alim came and picked him up to go and visit a friend, a young man, who diagnosed by cancer and was about to die. He said, we went. I said, okay, let's go. He said, we went to the hospital and visited this man. This man was, you know, diagnosed with cancer. The cancer was severe in late stages and he was about to die. He said, once he looked at us and we talked for a while, he started 
crying and weeping. He said, I am crying not because I am dying. I am crying for one incident that took place. He said, that a while ago my father passed away. But when he was sick in the village, he sent me a letter. At that time, you know, years ago, people used to write letters. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, by the advancement of, you know, iPhones and iPads and i iPods and i i i people even you know how they write a sentence at that time you know letters were there people knew how to you know do drawings some artistic things mashallah now with the social networkings all of those have been abandoned so this has happened 20 years ago he said that the father wrote him a letter told him I am sick come to me visit me he said. I grabbed the letter, I was so busy, I left it. After three months, I eventually made it to the village and visited my father. He said, once I visited my father, my father started crying. Told him, where did you leave me? You abandoned me. Your mother is dead, I am by myself. At least come and visit, you know. I thought something wrong has happened to you. He said, I told him, father, I am busy. I have so many things I have to do. I couldn't come. He said, well, at least consider me one of those busy things that keep you busy. Consider me one of them, one of those issues that you tackle every day. He said, okay, I am sorry, I am here. He said, I spent two days with him and then left. When I left, after one week, my father passed away. Now I am crying why I didn't spend another week. You know, he was about to die. At least I would spend one week, one week just to keep him happy. He was dying. I felt sorry for that moment of opportunity that God gave me, but I refused to take I didn't take it. I left it. This speaker, this scholar, he said, after he said this, and we left, we got out, I remember the hadith from the, from the Prophet, peace be upon him. I looked at my friend and told him, Subhanallah, I came up to recognize the hadith. He said, what is the hadith? He said that I have written somewhere, I have read somewhere that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Man aadha abawah ibtalahu allahu bida'in laysa lahu dawa. If someone hurts the feeling of his parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would inflict him with a disease that does not have any medicine, does not have any cure. He said, the man said, yes, I remember this hadith. This is his brothers and sisters. Anyway, go back to the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا First he says walidain, but he does not say which kind of walidain, which kind of parents. He doesn't say if they are believers or not, if they are hypocrites or not, if they are kafir or not. General parents, any parents, whether they are Muslims or kafirs or munafir, your duty as a son, your duty as a daughter is to show ihsan to them. You see, in an amazing verse, the biggest thing that we commit is what? In the eyes of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says that, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ If you commit shirk, this is the ultimate sin. God will not forgive this one. This is the ultimate thing. When he talks about, the, about parents, he says, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِهِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْ فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا If they force you that you make shirk, you commit sin against me, don't follow them. But immediately, what does it say? At the same time that you don't listen to them, you don't follow their order when they ask you to commit sin, but at the same time, you have to be nice with them. Show, you, show them your respect. Show them your love, your affection. Ma'rufa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ihsana, any kind of good things. Now the scholars have made a list. The first one, they say that you have to obey them. No matter how old you are. 
no matter if you are a muscular guy and you make, you know, your mustache rolling. Still, when a parent, when a father, a mother tells you, my son, don't go to this trip. If it's not necessarily, you don't have to go to the trip. Listen to them. For a certain reason, if that reason is valid, both men and women, regardless of the age, whether you're 40 years old or 20 years old, whether you have kids or not, your duty is to listen to them. One day, a man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a muscular man, and I love jihad. I would like to go with you for the jihad. But my mother is hesitant. She says that, don't go, stay with me. What should I do? Should I join you or not? The Prophet, peace be upon him, answered this, told him, Erja, go back to her. Go back to her. لَأُنْسُهَا بِكَ لَيْلَ خَيْرٌ مِنْ جِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ سَنَةٍ One night, she spends with you and she's happy. She's satisfied. It is better than one year of jihad. Of course, that jihad was not mandatory, meaning it was not a defense of the country or the city. In that case, all men and women, their duty is to defense to defend the, you know, the land, the territory. But that jihad seems to be not out of this. Probably it was, you know, some sort of mustahab, some sort of that they were other people who could do, carry out this thing. So the Prophet tells this man, stay with your, you know, with your mother. Listen to your parents. Your parents are not in your enemies. When they ask, for you to do something, they want your benefits. They're looking for your benefits. They want you to prosper. When they told you, don't do this, or do this, it is for your advantage. Let's say it is not rational. They ask something that is not rational, not good. You will lose. You have to go for a trip for business, but they tell you don't. At that time, don't tell them. Try to be polite with them. Even when you disobey them in such matter, keep your politeness. Keep your respect to your parents. Don't hurt their feelings. So the first one is obeying the parents. Of course, you know, there are um, certain times that you have to listen to parents. For example, when the daughter is getting married, the consent of her father is mandatory. The father has to give consent for the daughter to get married. If she's, you know, she's never been married before, she's bachelorette, at that time the consent of father, according to all marriage, it is mandatory to have. It's logic. You have to follow on this. So the first, brothers and sisters, is obeying. The second, you know, definition for ihsan that the scholars say, it is to treat them Nicely. I will elaborate on this after your salawat. <laughs> unfortunately, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, we, the Muslims who live in the West, have acquired some, you know, bad habits from, you know, these areas. When it comes to parents, we don't show that much respect to them. If you go to the narrations, I mean Islamic narrations, and look at the proper attitude, the proper way of dis discussing things with parents, talking with parents, behaving with parents, you will see we are a sharp contrast to what they describe. In the literature, in Islamic literature, tells you do not go in front of your parents. When they're walking, take a distance. Either walk behind them, or at least walk with them. Don't take an advanced step in front of them. That will consider to be aquq, aq. You know what aq? Aq is a state of ingratitude. It's a severe punishment. Entitles a severe punishment. When you speak with your parents, make sure the way you talk to your parents should not be the same way that you talk to your buddy, to your brother, for example, to your friend at school. Lower your voice as you speak to them. Unfortunately, 
Here in this country, we don't abide those rules. We talk to them as they are, you know, our servants, our mates. Hey, mom, you know, get me the cookies. Dad, in your way, get me some ice cream. They're not waitresses. They're not your, you know, your maid and your servant. The mother doesn't have to come and clean up after you. It is your duty to do this. And fortunately, and this is again, I'm saying unfortunately, many of our parents, they help, you know, the children to be that way. There is a hadith, strong hadith to the parent. It says, لَعَنَ حَمَلَ عَلَىٰ Allah cursed those kind of parents who allow their children to be in a state of ingratitude. Sometimes we call them by names. And instead of calling dad or mom, we use their names. This is again another sort of aquq. You see, the ayah came to the people of Medina, to the companions, telling them when you speak with the prophets, use this proper language. Ya When you speak, don't raise your voice in his presence. Be careful. When you talk to him, use the proper language. Don't say, Ya Muhammad. Many of them, you know, they were ruthless, uncivilized people, the nomad. They will come and say, Ya Muhammad, go with us, do this. Ya Muhammad, why don't you answer this question? The ayah came to tell the Muslims, when you talk, have a proper attitude with the Prophet. Use the proper language. From that time, the Muslims start in calling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Ya Rasulullah. Using the word, Ya Rasulullah. Among them was his daughter, Fatima. Fatima alayhi salam started calling her father, Ya Rasulullah. Before she would call him, Ya Abba, Dad, Father. But afterwards she started calling him, Ya Rasulullah. One day passed, two days passed. One day the Prophet grabbed her, told her, Ya Bunaya, why don't you call me Ya Abba? The call was not for you. The call was for those ruthless, for unpolite Arabs who don't have the way of talk. For me, I want you for you. I want you to say Ya Abba. I love the word Ya Abba. Don't call me Rasulullah. Call me Father. Call me Dad. Unfortunately, Many of us, when we refer to our parents, we use, you know, their names. And this is another sort of ingratitude. When you deal with your parents, have their respect. Talk to them in a respectful way. There's an elegant word from Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. He says that, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, Allahumma ja'alni ahabahuma haybat as-sultan al-asuf. Make me that I fear from them like the way I feel a ruthless king, a ruthless ruler, a maniac. How you, you know, fear him when you talk to him? Make that fear, instill that fear in me when I talk to my parents. Wa'abarrahuma barra al-umma al-rahuf. At the same time, when I care, take care of them, the same care that a mother cares for her children, give me that blessing that I would care them, care about them in the same way as a mother cares about her children. One day, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was called upon him, told, the companions came and told, Ya Rasulullah, there is a young man is about to die. He's in a very bad position. He cannot speak. He's speechless. Come to him. The Prophet went to him. Once he entered and saw that this man, his, you know, his tongue was locked, he cannot say anything. He said, Alihad al Ghulam, Um, does this young man has a mother? One of the ladies who were in, you know, in the surroundings said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, I am his mother. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told her, are you sad? Are you upset with him? Are you, you know, in a state of ingratitude 
with this young man? She said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. For six years, I did not talk to my son. For six years, I abandoned him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told her, forgive him now. Now he's in a very bad position, bad state, he's about to die. Forgive him. She said, Ya Rasulullah, at any time that I decided to forgive him, once I thought of what he has done to me, I could not. Sorry, I cannot forgive him. I tried many times, but every time, once I am about to forgive him, I remember what kind of things he used to do. How he used to physically attack me, hit me in front of his children, in front of his wife. I cannot forgive him. Again, the Prophet begs him, begs her, she doesn't listen. At that time, the Prophet says, Aliyya bil hatab. Get me some logs. Get me some woods and logs. She was puzzled what the Prophet wants to do. They get some logs and he asked them to set them on fire. When they set the logs on fire, he asked them to carry this young man and put him on the fire. She told him, what are you doing, Ya Rasulullah? She said, he said, I am doing the same thing that you are doing. But with a difference, I am burning him in this life while you are burning him in the hereafter. There is no match between this fire and the hellfire. I am doing exactly what you are doing. She said, I am forgiving him, Ya Rasulullah. At that time, when she said that I am forgiving him, he started to say, mumble some words. The Prophet told him to say, La ilaha illallah. This young man said, La ilaha illallah. His tongue opened up. As he opened up, the Prophet asked him to say those words. He said, Say this with me. Ya man yaqbal al yaseer. Wa ya'fu an al kathir. Iqbal min al yaseer. Wa'fu an al kathir. Inna ka anta al ghafoor al rahim. Oh God, accept this little thing from me. You're the one who will accept the little things from me and forgive me for my sins. This man started saying this. At that time, he started saying what he's seeing. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw a very repulsive, smelly, harsh, ruthless man grabbing me from here from my throat and suffocating me. Now that I am saying this, these words of the prayers, I saw that this man is taking a distance and seeing another man, a handsome one with very good smell, is approaching me. The Prophet tells him to repeat these ayat, these, you know, dua again and again, these words again. He said it until he was completely, you know, at rest. And he passed away. The Prophet saved this man from the, you know, the gratitude of being aq to his parents. Then the ayah continues. It says that وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا Your ihsan, your good deed does not stop only in this life. Once they are dead, you, forgive about, you forget about them. You need to continue with your blessings, with asking forgiveness, doing good things in behalf of your parents. There is a saying from the Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. He says that a man can be considered aq. When his parents were alive, this man used to be aq, meaning in a state of ingratitude. After death of his parents, he does good things in their behalf. He prays in, in their behalf. He gives to charities in their behalf. He does so many good things in, his, in their behalf. God erases his name from being aq and puts him in the name of Birr al-Walidayn, someone who has helped his family. In the other side, someone who has done good things to his parents, but once they die, he forgive, he forget about them. He does not mention them. Completely becomes oblivious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala crosses his name from Birr al-Walidayn and puts him in the list of being in the aqoq of their parents. Therefore, we have a duty as brothers and sisters. I complete with, you know, the speech with this beautiful story. It is narrated that one scholar, in his dream, had seen, you know, 
those deceased, those ones who he used to know, and they're all passed away. They're whispered in the sleep as he was, you know, dreaming. He said that one day on the eve of Laylatul Jum'ah, on the eve of Thursday night, he said that I have seen all of those spirits, all of them are happy. They're receiving good things from their children, of their family, those who were alive. They're sending good things for them. Except one man, one person, was very upset and saddened. He said that I went to him and talked to him and told him, what is wrong with you? Why are you so depressed? He said, because I don't have anybody to do good things for me. I only have one son, and this son is busy always. He doesn't send any good reward for me. Therefore, I am so upset. He knew who is this person, and knew that the son used to wash clothes at the riverbank you know, of Euphrates. He knew the son. He said, next day, as he you know, woke up from his sleep, you know, this is a story, maybe it is not realistic, but the spirit, the morale, is very realistic, brothers and sisters. He says that, he goes to the son and tells him, I have seen my father, he tells him the incident. He begged him to do good things in behalf of his father. The son says, I don't have anything. As you see, I only wash the clothes, sell them, barely that I can survive. I don't have anything that I will do in behalf of my father. He says that I insisted, I begged him so many times. He said, believe me, I don't have anything. Now that you're begging me, here. He grabbed a handful of water in his hand three times. He threw it on the sides of the rivers three times. He said, okay, here, this is in behalf of my father. This is all I can do for my father. He said, I left him, went back. Three nights later, I saw the spirit of his father. He came very happy. He said, you know, thank you very much. You went and talked to my son. My son, alhamdulillah, did a good thing. And I got the reward. He said, what did your son do? He grabbed a handful of water and he threw it on the side. He said, yes. In that side, there used to be a pond. In that pond used to be a tiny little fish. Was it trapped in that pond? When my son grabbed the water, this handful of water, and he threw it, it went right on the pond. The water level went up, this little fish could escape and get to the river. God has given me the reward. I have received the reward. That scholar says that after a few years, this son became rich. I saw this son develop his business, probably he opened dry cleans, I don't know, 100 years ago if there were dry cleans or not. But mashallah, he became wealthy, and rich due to one single act that you do. Don't forget your parents, brothers and sisters. If they're disease, deceased, go to their tombs. Recite some Quran for them. Recite some holy verses, some dua for them. That's what Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam did. When he left Medina, the first thing he did, he went to the tomb of his grandfather. He sat and recited some Qur'an, then he went to Baqiyya and visited the tomb of his mother. You see, brothers and sisters, the deceased, they're always, their eyes kept on you, even if they're gone, even if they're departed. They're always, you know, after, if something good happens to you, they become happy. If something bad happens to you, happens to you they become sad. The same thing with mother of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Fatima, it is narrated that every majlis, wherever there is a majlis, commemorating the memory of her son, Fatima stay there. She goes and attends. One of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq, his name is Mufaddal ibn Umar. He says that one day, I had a majlis, you know, commemoration of Imam Hussein. But I hated to go and tell the Imam al-Sadiq. Why? Because Imam al-Sadiq would cry dearly. He could not, you know, help it. I didn't want to break his heart. So one day, I did a commemoration in my house without letting him know. He said that after the commemoration, two days, I came back. He told me, Mufaddal, where were you? He said, I had a business of my own. 
He said, did you hold the commemoration of Hussein ibn Ali? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, but how did you know? I told the, you know, the rest of the companions not to tell you. He said, Mufaddal, I was sitting there, but you didn't notice. He said, where Ibn Rasulullah? He said, remember the, the, the room? At the doorstep, when you were walking, you know, at the doorstep of the door, you stumbled. Remember when you stumbled? It was a sheet of the cloth. Remember, it was white. It was my sheet. I was sitting there. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, you were sitting at the floor, at the doorstep of the madness. He said, yes. He said, why didn't you go in the middle? Go sit where the dignitaries is sat. He said, why would I sit there? Because there are Fatima and Rasulullah sitting there and watching and commemorating the memory of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Fatima used to come to the headless body of Imam Hussein after Ashura. When they beheaded the head of Imam, they took it with them by Khawalla. Khawalla took the head and went to Kufa to bring it to Ibn Ziyad. As he goes to Kufa, to Kufa, it was late, it was in the middle of night. At that time, he had no choice but to go to the, you know, to his home. He went to his home, he grabbed the head and put it in Tanur. You know what Tanur is. It's the oven that used to bake, you know, the breads in it. He puts it there. He comes back to his wife and told his wife, I have brought you a big surprise, a bigger prize. She told him, what did you brought? He says, I brought you the head of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. She tells him, damn you. People bring silver and jewels and gold to their families. You bring me the head of son of Rasulullah. I would not sleep with you anymore. I would not sit with you anymore. She leaves. She says that I left the door, I left the room, and went in the place that the head of Imam Hussein was there. All of a sudden, I see a light coming through the signal. Then I hear a moaning voice of a female who says, Bunaya Hussein, Oh my son Hussein, they have slaughtered you without knowing you. They have killed you without giving you a drop of water. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyy al-azim. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah al-Hussein. Wa ala al-arwaah al-lati hallat bifinaik. Wa anakhat birahlik. عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته